Good morning. Um, I just wanted to introduce very, very briefly this uh, first session this morning uh, on maritime security. Uh, in fact, I'm not going to say much of an introduction except to say that as we think about issues that affect the Atlantic space on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, this one is very, very near the top. So we're really delighted to be able to start this morning uh, with a discussion on uh, maritime security. And we're especially delighted to have our old friend Anton Lagardia, who's Africa and Middle East correspondent for The Economist here, to moderate this discussion. So uh, please welcome them. And Anton, over to you. Okay. Thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here on this uh, bright and early. We're going to have a video before we start to get you into the mood, and then we're going to move over to a great panel that I'll introduce to you in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. As a result of more economic activity and growing populations, activities on illegal ocean activities on the ocean have increased and bring, increased with, them and bring with them maritime security challenges, ranging from piracy, ranging from to, trafficking piracy and drugs, to trafficking and drugs, weapons and people. In order for governments to, in order for governments to rise to these cross-regional challenges, to they will need to be able to monitor what is happening on the seas, detect illegal activities, detect illegal and, activities and, develop and develop legal and administrative as frameworks, as well as adequate Coast Guard capabilities. What priority should there be? What priority should there be for international bodies to better promote, maritime, to better promote maritime governance and, and security, to security and to enforce links between law enforcement and financial security intelligence and financial intelligence services. Do we have the right international, do we have the right platforms, international involving platforms involving Europe, Africa, Africa, Africa and the Americas within which ideas on ocean, within which governance, ideas on ocean policy, governance and maritime can policy can be shared and implemented? Is there a coordinated effort between, there coordinated countries, effort between countries of the North and South Atlantic to address, Atlantic to address systemic economic, economic and social factors that cause maritime crime? What constitutes a long-term long and sustainable to response to the challenge of maritime insecurity? Right. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a great panel to discuss uh, the issues that you've just heard about. Uh, we've got um, Peter Pham from the uh, Africa Center at the Atlantic Council uh, in Washington. Uh, we've got uh, João uh, Ribeiro, who is the Director General of Maritime Policy in the Portuguese government, pulling together all aspects of maritime policy for Portugal. And then on my left, we've got Patrick Penix, who is the Executive Secretary of the Pompidou Group, uh, which is the uh, body of the Council of Europe that uh, thinks about countering uh, drugs trafficking and uh, drug abuse and consumption of drugs. Thank you very much. Peter, can I start with you, perhaps? Can you paint us a picture of how the situation has changed in the Gulf of Guinea? Uh, we, uh, you know, when I used to uh, started reporting Africa many years ago, uh, it used to be a problem of oil bunkering, of theft of oil. Uh, then it became a question of crime, uh, sort of armed robbery at sea, really. Uh, and it started to spread sort of either side of Nigeria. Now we've got drugs coming in. Paint us a picture of, this, of the problem at the moment and tell us how it has developed over the years. Well, certainly. Uh, thank you very much, Anton. The problem of any crime at sea really comes down to what I call the problem or the question of geography. Uh, is there a space where there are targets to be attacked? Uh, is there a space that enables safe havens for the attackers? And that space is not just physical geographic space, but also social space that accommodates it, and political legal space that either leaves enforcement wanting or enables corruption, enables this thing to happen. And it's all what you've described as scaling up of a problem from the theft of oil by people simply looking for something to burn, a little fuel, and that's grown now into a multi-billion dollar a year enterprise where whole tankers are lifted off and the oil subsequently sold uh, on the open markets of the world. We also see that with uh, the increase of the shipping and commerce in this region. We've talked about Africa merging, but the increase in shipping in the Gulf of Guinea area has 3 million 10 uh, ton equivalent units of commerce every year passing through. That's more, again, target rich environment. So as prosperity, as trade has increased, and as government's capacity has weakened, uh, we have this perfect uh, delta where these things occur. Thank you very much. Uh, Zhao, you have thought a lot about maritime policy in Europe, 
Um, tell us a bit how uh, you look at the Southern Atlantic and how you think, uh, so what needs to be done to, to secure it more effectively and um, uh, what progress has been made and what still needs to be done? Thank you, Anthem. Um, starting by saying that if security uh, starts overseas in the Atlantic Basin, we have to look to each other from a distance in an integrated manner and in a collaborative uh, way. So we need to be all engaged in complementarity to achieve the same goal of to, uh, to set the Atlantic Ocean as a sustainable uh, development area and uh, for that we need to sustain stability and any issue of security is an issue of concern. So strategies have been made but moving to the operational level, how to implement those, I start by saying five uh, main objectives. One is to generate uh, interagency platforms at coastal states level. This also includes the, the uh, new architecture of some legal regime in order to uh, enforce the rule of law at sea. On the other hand, we need not just to act locally, but also to act regionally. And we have already a considerable number of organizations dealing with issues of uh, security, more, more uh, upgraded, so to say, in the Northern Hemisphere, but also existence and moving with a certain positive dynamics. I can speak about ECOWAS, I can speak about ECAS, I can speak about the Council of the Gulf of Guinea, and that we have also to speak about the, Southern, the South America organizations. But I said already too, locally and regionally, but then we need to speak about integrating and shared information. And information is not just about maritime surveillance, about the picture, is the data flow, about the finances flow, is, is the question of providing context to the stakeholders that are working together to deal with these uh, generated threats. But we're still missing two. We need to identify in this framework where are the fragilities and where we should invest on capacity building to train and educate people. And train and educate people is not just a question to say, well, this is a topic for Africa and the efforts should be in Africa. Maybe a considerable amount, but this is an Atlantic Basin general problem. We need to see where we have gaps every day. And finally, we need to act at sea. We need to show presence. We need to be able to, uh, to act in, uh, with the rule of law and... Uh, impose the action of state, so to say, at sea. And this is a, a tremendous integration process, a demand, but a clear objective and purpose in order to sustain stability. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick, can you drill down a little bit into the specific question of drugs, which is uh, a problem that has grown, a, um, th the value of drugs being smuggled through Africa and through West Africa is often several times larger than the GDP of the countries. Uh, through which these drugs are passing. Can you paint a picture for us of how the problem has developed and how it has changed and evolved over the years? Yes, of course, Anton. You, you have to first see that um, drug trafficking is a global trade. That means that we're talking about three to 500 billion US dollars which are being traded every year. It's an enormous amount and as you said, I mean, it uh, surpasses a number of times the GDP of quite a number of countries in Africa, but also in other parts of the world. So we have to see that as a global trade. And what is the, uh, the characteristic of global trade? That is that we try to optimize profit. And that's also for the illicit trade the case. And what's happening, obviously, and that's not new for West Africa, uh, drug trade is going through West Africa, but more and more, not only concentrated on West Africa, but the whole of Africa. And that is a new tendency and that we have to be really aware of. Because drug trade and drug trafficking, illicit drug, tra drug trafficking, is something that moves very quickly. So forget your old concepts and get on to the new concepts and new realities very quickly. Because the drug traffickers, they go in such a fast manner that... Uh, they bypass all law enforcement and the international corporations that you can imagine. So that's my, my basic point. And also let's realize that the former transit countries, I'm talking to the countries in the Caribbean, I'm talking to the countries in West Africa, please my friends, these 
countries have become consumer countries and production countries. And that is something that is to be taken care of immediately. Um, the initiatives are taken to counter that. For us, as Pompidou Group, it remains a public health challenge in the first place. And we see that if you look at, for example, the Ebola crisis right now, drug trafficking and drug consumption in West Africa is a uh, uh, hidden new phenomena which we have to tackle quickly. Thank you. I want to come to the audience very quickly because I think the sort of conversation is the interesting part, uh, the most interesting part of these conversations. But let me just kick off with a couple of follow-ups. I'll take them in reverse order. Uh, so, Patrick, can you be a little bit more specific? How have the roots changed? Uh, give us some examples of, of the evolution that you talk about, the roots changing very quickly in response to conditions on the ground. Well, if I would ask the audience which are the major production countries, they would immediately come up with Afghanistan and Colombia and Morocco. Uh, for several different uh, substances. But did you, for example, know that Nigeria is one of the major producers of, uh, of methamphetamines, which are produced in Nigeria in clandestine labs and are exported to Japan? That gives you an idea of the global market. But also that now more and more, if you're speaking about the trade towards West Africa, my friends, that's an old tendency. We're talking now far more about the trade between, for example, Brazil and, and Sao, uh, from Sao Paulo going towards South Africa. And how the inner Africa uh, drug trade is being developed over land, over sea, by air. If you have a commercial airliner with 13 tons of cocaine fall in the Malian desert, then we know that there is a big problem. Um. Uh, Zhao, you spoke about the priority being identifying the gaps. Can you tell us what you think the gaps are and which are the ones that need to be filled with the greatest priority? Well, speaking about the Atlantic, uh, we can identify two major gaps in terms of traps that we need to address. The drug trafficking, of course, is, is one of those. The other one is on, uh, on capacity building we have to provide to the more fragile uh, territories where uh, uh, robbery at sea, armed robbery at sea, or even piracy uh, could, could occur. But we also cannot disregard that the Atlantic itself is a source of resource and a source of illegal action. And uh, illegal, unreported, or unregulated fishing is, is something uh, which becomes a threat, in particular having in consideration the need to uh, keep uh, fishing stocks in uh, uh, sustainable uh, management uh, uh, levels. So those are implications. Together, some of them aligned with the environmental issues uh, uh, and, and the sense that the ocean is, is, a, is unique for the mankind. We need to, to uh, improve literacy of the populations in those coastal zones in order to ensure that in the middle of the ocean, we also have to sustain sustainability, sustain um, stability in order to promote this area as an area for development in the future for the benefit of, of the populations. But is there a bit of coast that worries you? Is there a bit of capability that's a glaring gap? Is it lack of aircraft or is it lack of radar or is it a particular bit of coast of a particularly fragile country that worries you right now? Well, when, when we try to collaborate, we can, make, we can put a lot of hardware together. But to build trust in order, for instance, to ch share information is also something that mm. should be priority one. And we have to consider, uh, I, have ex I have a lot of experience in discussing community uh, uh, dimensions of those. And one of the things that uh, we have to make sure is when people share information, there is a sense of ownership of the, of the process. So the subsidiarity element here is essential, and we need also to find affordable tools. This is not, so sorry to say, this is not a defense business. This is something that we have to address in an affordable way in order to provide a sense of ownership to everyone. Thank you. Uh, which takes us um, to, to the question I wanted to ask Peter, which is, you know, we've done a lot, there's a lot has been done in counter-piracy in the uh, Gulf of Suez, in the Indian Ocean. 
uh, the numbers of carnage. It really is quite striking if you look at the maps of how many fewer dots of incidents there are now in the Indian Ocean uh, and how many more there are in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, Gulf, of, in the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, are there lessons that can be brought from uh, the counter piracy operations in the Indian Ocean that can be applied in, uh, in the Gulf of Guinea, or are there such different places that you need a completely different toolbox? Well, the, uh, the piracy, Anton, in the, uh, off the east coast of Africa, the Gulf of Aden and uh, the, eastern, uh, the western Indian Ocean, and that in the eastern Atlantic Gulf of Guinea, are different phenomena in the types of targets and the operators, but the basic taxonomy is the same. First, piracy or any other crime at sea, whether it be drugs, smuggling or illegal fisheries, all require land. There's a land base, and the land base means that governance is weak. So we have to build the capacity of governments to govern the spaces on land. That's the safe haven. Second, one has to make it sure that crime doesn't pay. At the height of the piracy epidemic in East Africa, I, I came up with a data set before 18 months of the highest piracy activity, and during that period, only 60% of the pirates who were caught by navies were released immediately. Of the 40% taken into custody, only one in 20, so 2% of the total, were ever convicted. Well, if you only have a 2% chance, a one in 50 chance of paying for your crime, uh, and you're living in very desperate situations on land, no wonder you take, take up crime. So we have to make sure that there's law enforcement. And then thirdly, we have to close loopholes. Uh, in East Africa, the loophole was the want of a judicial system that would take these pirates on and try them. In West Africa, uh, we have the loophole of the fact that the international legal definition of piracy is crimes taking place on the high seas, uh, which leaves unreported in the, those dots you referred to, all the many armed robberies on water that occur within the territorial sea. So there we need better information sharing. So all those things affect not only piracy, but all the other illegal activities that we have to deal with. Because just to be clear, the, the, the piracy that has been taking place in the Indian Ocean and, and, and around East Africa has been on the high seas or really quite far out at sea, hundreds of miles out. Whereas most of the incidents that are happening on West Africa tend to be in coastal waters, access to ports, often ships anchored at sea uh, waiting, waiting to come into port, or indeed sometimes one of the reasons you get under-reporting is that you have, uh, you have uh, you know, ships doing illegal stuff like transferring fuel and then they get, they get hit by, uh, by pirates. It's sort of double crime and people don't want to report it because they've been involved in illegal activity. Um, uh, let's take some questions, shall we? Because you've had enough of me. Let's hear what questions are on, on your mind. Does anybody have a question? Come on, guys, it's early morning, I know. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Anton. Ivan Weber with the German Marshall Fund. Um, i uh, based in Washington now, but uh, originally from the Balkans and Serbia. And uh, as you may know, there's been a, a big uh, arrest of a huge trafficking gang uh, that worked out of Uruguay and Latin America on cocaine, um, a big heist of three tons um, three years ago. One of the linchpins, uh, a national from the region, no need to mention the countries, we know them. But uh, what became apparent is, of course, the, the amount of cash that these people have. And they can literally buy out, not only people on the shore or the guy who transports it by truck, but politicians and not only politicians in the region, but politicians in the big countries. And so the question is, how does one address this uh, fact of the abundance of uh, means and resources that these people have to both uh, fuel and um, lubricate their uh, dynamics, but how does one curtail that? And of course, Africa is, is one of the passageways. The Mediterranean is also. And the way that these, this gang was arrested was, of course, through concerted coordination of the DEA, of the British SOCAR, of the regional police services, of the Latin American police service. So again, if I can put it, it's an Atlantic dialogue, or rather an Atlantic cooperation that it can only stem this. Are we making progress in this, in, in this direction? And wh wh how does one tackle the cash flow problem? Thank you very much. Uh, there was a question right here. Let's take 
one more and then we'll come back to the panel. Thank you. Uh, I'm Blidi from uh, Cote d'Ivoire, but working for uh, ISS Dakar. I am writing on uh, security. I'm a researcher. I think uh, the problem, currently the problem is in uh, the Gulf of Guinea. We are talking about the Atlantic, yes, but frankly, the problem currently in the Gulf of Guinea, because in the east, the problem is almost down. So I think we should uh, uh, find a solution for the Gulf of Guinea. As I know, there are many, many strategies already written on the, uh, to, 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 to overcome the maritime insecurity in the Gulf of Guinea. International Maritime Organization has a strategy. Uh, European Union has a strategy. The U.S. have one. Uh, the NATO has one strategy. But ECOWAS itself has one strategy, which is already adopted. But the problem is the implementation of this strategy. In my, in my mind, I think we should help ECOWAS to implement not by charity, but it's the interest of everybody because it's the economic interest for the world. As we have said, this is the place we have we all crude oil in Nigeria and in the Gulf of Guinea, and the main things, you know, fishing, we are talking about fishing. So I, I'm not going to be long, but just to say, I think instead of uh, writing many, many strategies, on West Africa, it should be better to help ECOWAS to implement its current uh, uh, maritime strategy. Thank you. Let's come back. Uh, Patrick, money. I mean, uh, is that the way to stem, stem the drugs trade and, and the other illegal activity that is taking place? And how much more can be done? Obviously, uh, money is the core of the issue. But let's also make sure, you know, in order to reply to our colleague here, that it's important to actively confront also the political and governance challenges, which incite basically corruption within governments, security services, and the judiciary. So that's not only a money question, it is also a question of how do we want to build the capacity in our different countries, and how do we want to counter also this whole fear of intervention? Uh, let's face it, I think we absolutely need to be able to come in an international uh, cooperation um, mood in order to be able to tackle these issues. There are a number of initiatives which have been taken, and they involve the governments of the region. And they involve also Europe and the United States in them. They're often very partial and focused on specific items, but they're all interlinked. We have projects like CoCare, which focus on cocaine trafficking between uh, the Caribbean and Africa, but also projects like AirCop, which cooperate uh, air traffic control of, um, of, of cocaine trafficking and other drug trafficking. So these are international initiatives, which are Europe and international wide, so including with the United States and Canada. And these are the kind of things, law enforcement action and capacity building, that we need to focus on. On the specific question of money, I mean, is it more that can, you know, a lot is done on terrorist financing. Can, can the same lessons be applied to drugs financing? We deal with, it's, it's not the drug financing, the drug finances a number of other things. Uh, the drug fi drugs finance uh, terrorism, drugs finance human trafficking, drugs finance, um, um, uh, finance uh, arms trafficking. So that is the reality that we are confronted with. So money is the core of the issue, indeed, because the profit is there. When we speak about, for example, heroin pr production, if you speak about uh, the poppy, uh, from the poppy to the heroin, and you speak about 16,000%, 16,000% of benefit, of profit made on this, then we know that there is a key issue there. Okay. Do you want to pick up that point on, on you know, whether more can be done on the finance side? Well, well, certainly, uh, we have to close those loopholes that are there for the financing. We have places, uh, you know, we talk often about the lack of banking in Africa, and yet there are places along the Gulf of Guinea 
where there are more banks than can be commercially justified, and we know what's going on there, and we don't need to identify the nation in question, but there are far more international bank branches there than are justified by any economic calculus, so one has to crack down on that and have the political will to confront it. And there's also the, the governance issue of governments that uh, fail to pay their security services. It's not just a matter of resources for uh, uh, the implementation of strategies, but also a matter of basic payment. In a way, uh, not to justify corruption at the level, at the low levels, but one begins to understand it when they go months without payment, and then they turn, accept payment from a drug dealer or someone else to turn the other way. So those are some of the issues that we need to confront, the professionalization of the armed services and the security and police services as well. Zhao, are there too many strategies? No, well, and it uh, is, is the one, is ECOWAS yeah, is the best I, I, one. I, I'm, I'm trying to give a broader answer to a very high complex problem when we combine both. But in fact, we are dealing with a financial problem. We are, we are touching and dealing with the circumstances. But we cannot forget the long-term view of having a, uh, s achieving stability and sustained stability in the basin, supporting blue growth for everyone. So this, this should be the main objective. So, uh, and, and coming, with, uh, coming to, uh, to answer uh, the question uh, made by uh, our colleague from the Gulf of Guinea, is that, uh, uh, in fact, we need to have a more actionable, comprehensive approach to the topics. We cannot just offer a security tool. We need to combine with development tools. We still, like in the Afghanistan, we have not found yet a, a viable economic option to replace poppy fields. So as we probably are not able to replace other drug factories around the world, ones that exist, and, and, and any more sophisticated uh, uh, options for the future to provide a source of uh, addiction to the society and to break the links in the society. So this is a continuous dynamic process. We are just dealing with the current situations. But to address this comprehensive approach and touching a little bit on the measures of the strategies, we are Europe is reshuffling the, the, the critical maritime routes program because he had made uh, uh, in, 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 in a frame of the EU Africa strategy, uh, reframed, uh, uh, achieved some progress on the trade negotiations. So we are addressing the, the sustainable development in the area, and we, we need to reconfigure the way we operate on, on, on the security topics in order to combine both. And obviously, we just cope with those type of threats if we fight social exclusion, and if we fight if for informational exclusion in terms of literacy, what is relevant for, for the society, and how should we, be, should we be proactive in fighting any sources of instability. So. Great. Thank you very much. We had some more questions. Uh, we had a lady here, we had a gentleman there next, and then there was somebody down here. Good morning, Sonia Toro from the EU Africa Chamber of Commerce, based in Brussels. Actually, uh, I am tweeting on the on the session today, and I'm very surprised that uh, I have quite some reaction on Twitter. And you probably have already answered the question, but I promised to somebody on Twitter to raise the question. So I received a question uh, from somebody in Tanzania just asking, I mean, this is also a huge problem in Tanzania, and how can we collaborate to solve this? I just promised, so that's why I'm asking the question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for relaying that one via Twitter. This is a wonderful electronic age. Yes, please. Yes, my name is Jaime Nogueira Pinto. I'm from Lisbon, and I have um, some uh, private security uh, companies operating in, this, in Africa, Mozambique mainly. And what, what we have seen, uh, I think, in the in Somalia coast was that, of course, uh, practically, it was a, a great reduction of this piracy, of, but the costs were extremely high. And uh, I think this is something we have to, to think in order to, to split the costs between public and private, because some of these operations, of course, must be protected by the people who are carrying itself and uh, we have some some experience on that and we saw that there's a serious reduction once 
you have, for example, security teams on board. Normally, pilots that are business people, they avoid risks. So it's something, this situation, I think, works, has worked quite well. But the costs are extremely high. And second point, and I think it was, it was mentioned, is the fact if we go more and more to have empty vacuums of political order, empty territories, I think we have, we have to deal with the problem will, will grow because uh, as uh, international crime, what we have been seeing is the important thing is the network of distribution. From these networks you have traffic of people, traffic of drugs, piracy, everything. It's a, a multi, multiply business and uh, this is the, the important thing. And just to finish, with an experience in, uh, in the Western Africa coast, in Guinea-Bissau, the military were extremely involved in this traffic. The chief of Navy was, was captured by the USDA and is now waiting for, for, for to pass in court in, in uh, New York. So, but it was the chief of the Navy. Actually, it was the chief of the Navy of Guinea-Bissau. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was one, there was one more here and then we'll go back. Keep your questions ready. And I, oh, sorry, uh, you were first, yes. Over here and then we'll come here. Thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. I'm Landry Signier from Cameroon, and I think um, you already addressed part of my question. It's related to um, drug trafficking. Two years ago about, I wrote a piece on drug trafficking in uh, West Africa, Guinea-Bissau, and I was threatened, I received anonymous emails where I was threatened. Uh, at that time, about 27% of cocaine coming, uh, uh, delivered in Europe was coming from uh, West Africa. Um, and Sorry, what was the proportion? 27%. So, in context, you address the notion of inclusion, but we also sp uh, spoke about governance. In a context where presidents are killed, presidents uh, who are trying to address the issues are killed, are killed or researchers who are independently conducting uh, projects are treated, uh, how will you efficiently address uh, the question of uh, drug trafficking? Uh, and simultaneously, we have the notion of corruption, fa failed state, political disorder. So the, the question is much more complex than the political will. And it is not neither just a question of inequality because people who are uh, leading those uh, traffics are part of the elite. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go to our panel. So you had a question about Tanzania. Uh, you had a question about the inordinate cost of anti-piracy, uh, the question of political vacuum, which has come up in different forms, the fact that you know, how can you cooperate with governments that, government officials that may themselves be corrupt and part of the drugs problem, and uh, and the sort of the sort of the, the, the sort of ugly threats that are being extended uh, by the drug traffickers against independent researchers and indeed uh, leaders. Uh, who wants to start? Let's start here. Let's start. Well, uh, just before. Uh, answer the, the question raised by the, the, this, uh, this uh, very helpful idea from, ten, from uh, uh, integrating Tanzania projects. Uh, just to have an idea, in Europe we have more than 400 agencies involved in maritime security. So the dimension of integration is huge. The dimension of the networks are huge. But we need to understand the framework of the international organizations as well. And probably you also know that in, in Africa, African Union uh, has promoted a, an integrated maritime strategy for all uh, the continents. And, and some of the issues addressing uh, sustainable development are coming from the vision of that strategy. But when we speak about secu maritime security, we are uh, addressing regional organizations, the regional economic organizations. So we, we need to rely upon the role of African Union, probably, to make the engagement and the integration of those uh, uh, good and positive uh, projects uh, that might be integrated, but, uh, uh, of course, across uh, these economical regions. Uh, when, uh, when we speak about uh, the... Um, the, the problems of, um, of um, how to uh, 
fight the, 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 the drug trafficking or, or ad, any other source of trafficking, I think the end state in terms of, of capacity building is to generate resilient societies. And to generate resilient societies, we need to rely upon education, and, and we have to train the institutions, we have to improve the literacy in order to address the problems and also the solutions. So resilience should work against erosion, and the, and the, the routes always explore erosion. They play with the money because the, the societies are erosive. So we need to build resilient societies, basically. Thank you. Peter, do you want to pick up some of those points? Yeah, let me just uh, address the, the question of the cost, which is a very important question. The most recent data that we have was a study just released a few weeks ago by the Danish Ship Owners Association, uh, which is important for maritime commerce because they carry 10% of the world's commerce uh, on their vessels. And the study revealed that the total cost, this is a problem that affects everybody, that's why it's not just the African countries immediately affected, everyone involved. It costs the world economy and in lost trade 28 billion a year. And, it, and the direct cost to ship owners and countries that have to deploy navies et cetera, is somewhere between seven and 12 billion dollars a year. So it's a tremendous cost. So we have to come up with a sustainable model to share these costs. The, the risk, and I'll, I'll just conclude with the, the risk. The risk is with the decrease in piracy off the east coast of Africa that the ship owners, many of whom are watching costs, will dispense with embarked security, which has kept the piracy down. And the infrastructure for piracy still exists in Somalia. It'll be back tomorrow if the, if the security goes away. So I think that there's a, ri there's a risk there. And so we ha one has to look for a sustainable model in the short term to pay for the cost, and the long term, the development issues to, and the issue of governance on land. Uh, thank you. Well, I would say one thing is that uh, the Atlantic dialogues in the illicit trade is functioning very well and operates very decisively on our world markets today. So that is the first thing that we need to take, in, take into account. So anything that we want to do is trying to catch up, basically. Uh, I think it is incredibly important to ensure that there is a shared responsibility between uh, producer, transit, and, and consumer countries of drugs, basically, but of any, any trade, basically. So I think what we need to do there is to not only ensure that at the level of governments there is a good cooperation, but also law enforcement initiatives have to be taken. And my biggest concern, quite frankly, for Africa, for West Africa today, is maybe less the criminal aspect but more the health consequences that we will be seeing in the next couple of years on African societies and what it is going to do to disbalance even further the development of the countries in Africa. Thank you very much. And just, just to pick up one point that maybe wasn't quite answered, I mean, the, the issue of sharing information and cooperation has come up repeatedly. At the same time, there's a question of trust. If you're going to share intelligence, you need to trust your counterpart. If your counterpart happens to be someone who's been arrested as himself an alleged uh, drug dealer, how can you actually cooperate uh, with these agencies that may themselves be infiltrated by, uh, by drug if I, if I may on that, I mean, there is, I, I think, an example of good practice is the Caribbean Basin Maritime Security Cooperation. That's an excellent example of cooperation also because countries are very closely uh, linked together and the seas are more or less overseeable. But one of the um, elements that was uh, seen a, as one of the, let's say, countering any further cooperation was, was the, the, the fear of loss of sovereignty. And that is something that we have to look into as well. That is, to which extent any international cooperation will impact on the sovereignty of the state, especially then if we see there is that there is corruption at the top of, of the state. And there was a question from Tanzania. Does anyone want to pick up whether Tanzania has a specific role to play? Uh, I tried to say that uh, through the integrated maritime strategy of the African Union, they may and should try to uh, integrate uh, 
instruments available in different uh, maritime, in different African economic regions, okay. because economic regions are the ones who address security, uh, maritime security in the continent. Thank you very much. Let's go back to the audience. There's a question here. Hello, go I'm Gwane Legumbi from South Africa. Um, I've noticed the business model in drug trafficking is mm -hmm. similar to that of rhino poaching or wildlife uh, trafficking. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the agencies, all of them, seem not to be above the, the curve. They are behind whatever is happening. They're not fast enough. You're not consolidating your efforts. You are all, all over the place. So the three questions really I have. You touched on the issue of communities. What is an incentive for a community in Africa which is living in a fragile state, they are poor, and these drug traffickers who are supplying into the major capitals of the world, they offer them money right there and then. What is the incentive to turn away from that and start working with you? That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, on the issue of infrastructure to fight the challenges we have, it looks like you are a dinosaur. You are obsolete in the way you approach the problem. These organizations, these suppliers are much more nimble, they are faster, they are like a, a cheetah in a savanna. You are like an elephant in a thicket. You're not moving fast enough. You're moving in the wrong direction. They are elsewhere. You are always trying to pick up what they have done. Are you using the right tools, assets, in to try and cap the problem? And third and finally, what are we saying about the demand? Have we lost that fight? Thank you very much. There's a question yeah. here. Okay. Well. My name is Marcos Freitas, I'm from Brazil. And uh, building on what you said before, which I think is interesting, Brazil used to be a passage state. And then all of a sudden, as the economy became better, all, the, all of a sudden the drugs start stopping in Brazil, and it made Brazil become the second largest consumer of drugs in the world. Now, uh, individually, if you take the European Union as a whole, then you have the European Union, the United States, and Brazil. So passage states need to understand that eventually those drugs are not going to be passing through all the time, that eventually they're going to stay there once the economy becomes better, and that's, I think, one of the issues, one of the challenges there. Now, we do understand that the cost of doing something can really be too high instead of, instead of the cost of doing nothing. Is there one policy that you'd advise to any government that nowadays is a passage country that they could do and implement so that they can stop this problem at the root. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And there was a question behind you. Chris Sabatini with the Council of the Americas and Columbia University. Uh, two very quick questions. One is, uh, what do you do? Much of what you talked about assumes that there are pockets of complicity inside governments. What do you do when a government itself either actively or passively is engaged in the drug trade or does not want to cooperate. Take the case of Venezuela, where it is close to being a rogue regime on a number of matters of, of trafficking and crime, uh, where it simply doesn't want to cooperate. The second issue is actually the last question up there. I'm not the asker. I'm not anonymous. But what effect does decriminalization have? Is it good, bad, or is it just a huge distraction on, this, uh, uh, on the international drug trade? Thank you very much. Anybody else? We're running out of time. Let's have one more. Just urge you to be as brief and concise as you can so we can get everything answered. <clears throat> we can't hear the microphone. No, it's not your fault. It's just try again. Yeah, go for yeah, it. Sorry, very briefly. The, um, you know, yesterday we spoke about uh, international trade, encouraging more north-south trade, creating industrial clusters, um, private-public partnerships. And it seems that the illegal industries have been very successful in this respect. Are there any lessons for policymakers for legal trade to learn from how these industries emerged? Thank you. Startup drugs trade. Um, anybody else? Twitter length questions? 140 characters? <coughs> OK, fine. Uh, so you've just to summarize the question. You had the question about poverty and the degree to which poor, poorer communities can resist the lure of the drugs trade. Uh, are Community, are governments moving fast enough? Are they like elephants in a thicket? Uh, and what do you do about demand, which also goes to the point of our colleague here who raised the question of decriminalization. Uh, and the very relevant question of 
passage states uh, that may become consumers themselves, the example of Nigeria you mentioned earlier, uh, and uh, the question of um, whether the nimbleness uh, of the drugs trade has anything to teach licit trade. <laughs> Who would start? Peter. Let me just tackle uh, a few of those. The question of communities, I think, is import a very important one. Thank you for it. But I think the, the key thing is that any illicit trade, whether it be piracy, drug trade, human trafficking, whatever, has a corrosive effect on that community. Certain individuals may get a momentary gain, but the drug use, as we've mentioned already, returns to that community, it begins there, it rots the community. The traditional hierarchies and orderings are overturned when you have new wealth coming in. So the community itself has uh, a serious disincentive uh, in the intermediate and long term to not want the trade. Are governments not moving quickly enough? Perhaps not, especially on the issue of cooperation between themselves. Uh, the Gulf of Guinea, for example, requires a regional force, of, and the strategies talk about it, but governments, we've been talking about it for years, and yet every little country has, wants to have its own navy to sail 50 kilometers back and forth, uh, and, the next, and the cooperation, there have been some progress, but not enough, and certainly. And finally, on the question, uh, just to uh, tackle the question, what can we learn from the illicit uh, networks, it's the same things that we discussed that is required for a legitimate trade. You need to build infrastructure, build ties across. What's, that's, what, how does the drug trade occur? I was in, uh, uh, about a decade and a half ago, when I was in West Africa and living there, they were, the future traders today were putting out runways in places where there was no other economic reason for it. They were claiming that future resorts would be built there. Yeah, right. Uh, but there were runways being put in. They put in the infrastructure, the trade followed, and everything, and they made ties to local communities. All the things that one should be doing if one wants to encourage legitimate and growth sharing, equitable, fair trade. Thank you. Is okay, there, is there well, any point you want to pick up? Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to emphasize that each case is a particular case and requires a specific uh, uh, solution. But uh, we have examples in the world that we need to take in consideration. If we just look on a security strategy to touch the problems, and uh, we, may we, we may end up in a situation that we are facing and perhaps not recognizing that much. One is that the lack of international invest investment, for instance, in the North Africa, is as found just parallel in, in the difference, economical difference between the North and South Korea. So what will be the end result? You tend to build a wall. And this won't fix the problem and won't generate everyone at the end. So uh, when we speak about how to address the problem of replacement options, to a society that, at the time, is elusive in, fa in, fa in face of, of drug trafficking. We, we, of course, we need to invest in education, but we need to have the international investors investing in the regions, because it's the only way to prove development could, in face, be alternative. Uh, and uh, and we, can, we can better balance security. And, and develop in, the, and in, in that way. And we, we, we have examples also of principles and intentions we would like to follow. I emphasize that in, in the Busan Partnership Conference tries exactly to specify fundamental principles in which we should intervene addressing security and development. And I invite you all to try to uh, read it and perhaps imagine options for uh, a solution that I think I have no, no sound. No, okay. you're, ba you're, you're back so again. I cannot put my, sh my I cannot go uh, sit very well in the, in, in, the, in the chair, but no problem. <laughs> uh, finally, when we speak about dedicated forces, uh, we, we, from experience, we know that we address trafficking with specific task forces, uh, with very specialized communities and with very dedicated, locally installed coordination platforms. We did that in, in Portugal internationally through the uh, Mayoc uh, Center, for instance, in, in trying to act in coordination towards the South Atlantic. But this type of tool perhaps could be useful 
either for drug trafficking, either for other, other organized crime uh, approaches in the Gulf of Guinea, for instance. So we need to be more focused locally to, uh, uh, in fact, be able to uh, intervene. But of course, we need to gain the hearts and minds of the populations. So we need to gain the motivation of the locals to be engaged in the process. So it's not just a question of education and literacy. We need, in fact, to find the right messages to motivate the, the population. And that is a responsibility of the local politicians. When we say that the politicians sometimes are also erusive, I don't want, I don't want to see a government system as a, with a title as such is an individual which is now part of a problem and not part of the solution. But we need to have the bridge and the doors open for this dialogue because we need to gain the motivation of the populations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Well, three words, one about the community, one about an elephant and one about a cemetery. A community, uh, what is the incentive of the community to fight uh, addiction, for example, and trafficking? Uh, look at the example of Russia today, my friends. It's, what is happening in Russia is that uh, due to the lack of a coherent, coordinated policy, what happens is that the stagnation of HIV and AIDS in the world is compensated by an enormous increase of HIV and AIDS in Russia and in Ukraine today. That, if that is an incentive, I think that can be a clear incentive. The elephant. Of course, the international conventions on which our system, current system is based is probably outdated and will be debated quite radically at the United Nations uh, very shortly. But also, let's face realities. Last year in Europe, we had 81 new psychoactive substances come onto the market. So that basically means law enforcement, even to recognize those substances, takes already an enormous effort to do. Third, the cemetery. Because we all talk, and it's of course nice to speak about dialogue and cooperation and wanting to work together. I'm sorry, my friends. Europe, for the time being, has been condemned at several occasions for their push-back policy. A push-back policy, pushing back illegal migration, drowning people in the Mediterranean. And many uh, politicians, uh, human rights defenders, have condemned governments of Greece, of Italy, for their pushback policies. And that's what we are right now doing. We're not geared towards international cooperation. We're geared towards everyone for himself. Could you just pick up, Patrick, two uh, specific questions that came out? One, the, the problems in transit states that become big consumers themselves. I'm thinking particularly perhaps of Nigeria that you mentioned. And the second point on decriminalization is one of the ways of reducing that huge uh, economic incentive uh, because of the vast markup from, produce, from production to street value is one of the answers not decriminalization or, or at least some of the drugs. I don't know if it's on subject, but the, the, the whole question of decriminalization, Europe is obviously uh, has been experimenting with decriminalization for quite some time. And right now, the whole debate in Latin America is not so much about decriminalization, but about legalization, which is a slightly different uh, or radically different subject. And I, I don't know if my colleagues from Colorado are here, which I had a few exchanges with yesterday. Um, what does that, how does that impact? How is that going to impact the North-South cooperation. We were speaking a little bit about the Rio Grande. And in Mexico, one of the key issues is to which extent are we going to be prohibiting products which, once they cross the border to the United States, become legal products? And that is a crucial, a very crucial issue. Now, about the transition of uh, uh, f to become a consumption country. Today, there is not a single country which is only a producer country. There is not a single country which is only a transit country. There is not a single country which is only a consumer country. Afghanistan is the first place in the world where drug heroin addiction affects up to babies because the whole environment in which the babies grow up is infected and infested by heroin. And that is, that is the realities. So, Especially when we talk about South Africa, when we talk about Brazil, 
Of course, they are the richer countries in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in their respective uh, continents, basically, but are also becoming enormous hubs for transit and destination from Tanzania, from Kenya, from which are hubs uh, in, a, in a world system. The precursors for drugs are produced in China, they're produced in India, they free flow to Africa, where we start illegal labs and which will affect the country's concert and the public health concert of, of the people there. Thank you very much. I'd like you to join me in thanking uh, Peter Pham, João Rivero, and uh, Patrick Penix for uh, illuminating and, and frank, frank discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Anton, a very, very big thank you to you for this. I mean, this was a terrific discussion, and I hope you'll agree was also a window into a lot of other extraordinarily important issues for us. Um, we're going to have a brief coffee break of about 25 minutes, uh, and then we're going to reconvene here to talk about another a very central issue in the Atlantic, which is energy and energy security. Uh, and I have been asked to make one other housekeeping uh, announcement to you, which is that if you've signed up for the visit to the Medina, it will be at 5 o'clock, buses will depart at 5 o'clock from just in front of the conference center here. So thank you very much and see you shortly. <laughs>